This is Crispin Freeman, and you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-01. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D-12. Hello, team. Welcome back, and thanks for joining us for episode 13 of Whelmed Season 3. Nothing ominous about that at all. My name is Rich, and with me is my co-host, Emily. Hey, everybody. In these review episodes, we'll be diving into the plots, characters, themes, Easter eggs, comic book history, and everything else of Young Justice, and use all of that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes, but we will be diving into them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. I know, I know, being a freak's a good thing. (laughs) And the Halloween dance will be good fun. Halloween's canceled. Sorry, guys, but we're going to Greater Bialya, and we're going now. We have a solid lead on Tara Markov. I'm ready. So am I. Though I would prefer to change into my halo clothes first. Sorry, Violet. I need you to stay here in case Vic needs another halo cleanse. Bioship time. Good girl. Violet, I want you to know... No speeches, Prince. We're going. Now. And with all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily Ford. Hello, Megan. The title of this week's episode is True Heroes. The release date was January 25th, 2019. The in-episode dates were October 31st, Halloween, to November 1st. The writer for this week's episode was Kevin Hopps. The director was Christopher Berkeley, and the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thomason. The special guest voice credits, uh, Troy Baker splits off to give us Mr. Bliss, in addition to Brion. Uh, Diane, Del- uh, Diane Delano? Sure. Diane Delano, I'm going to say. Sure. Uh, as <laughs> Devastation, the love-struck Devastation. Yuri Lowenthal as Icicle Jr. and Tommy Terror. Zeno Robinson, of course, splits off from Vic to also give us Holocaust. And <laughs> this is so good. <laughs> yes, it is. Tara Strong as Tara Markov. Tara. Tara Markov. I, well, I can say, I guess, Tara Markov. But Bliss definitely calls her Tara. Yeah. It's, which is, and she's, which is list, she's listed in the credits as, as Tara and Tara, spelled two different ways. Yeah, I love it. Excellent. Okay. So just make, 100%, just yeah. make your superhero name your real name. Take a cue from Artemis. But change, thank, I was going to say, thank you, Artemis. two letters. <laughs> All right, let's do this briefing. Oh, my. Just in time for your next mission. This week's episode starts in Happy Harbor, where Brion, Violet, Forager, and Victor Stone are all getting ready to go to the annual Happy Harbor High School Halloween dance. But the festivities are interrupted by Nightwing arriving to tell the group that they're now headed to Greater Bialya to investigate a lead about Tara Markov. The whole Outsiders team, as we know it, is going on this super secret field trip, except for Halo, who Nightwing insists needs to stay home with Dr. Jace and Victor in case Vic gets possessed by the father box again. And she's fine with this decision. It's fine. Everything's fine. This episode is fine. After the credits, we see the Outsiders on the bioship heading to Greater Bialya, Karak, where <laughs> Nightwing gives everybody a heads up on what's going on. Garfield's little adventure last episode taught us that the good goggles are designed to test people for the metagene. If the test comes back positive, the goggles then brainwash the person wearing them so that they'll go to the nearest meta trading depot. The League and the team are currently taking down all of these outposts, and the Outsiders are hitting the one in Greater Bialya because they're pretty sure Tara Markov is there. Meanwhile, back in Happy Harbor, Halo is having a literal panic attack over her new boyfriend being in danger. Uh, She and Victor have decided to skip the Halloween dance, but Violet is so anxious about Brion that Jace tries to calm her down the same way she used to calm down her own daughter. 
And Jace chooses not to elaborate on her tragic backstory, but Victor's father box can sense Halo's current vulnerability and repossesses him for reasons that cannot be good. Uh, and back in Crater Bialia. So that's all we're saying about that scene. So much is happening. We'll get to it. Uh, because back in Greater Bialia, the outsiders are scoping out the Mediterranean outpost. Because back in Greater Bialia, the outsiders are scoping out the Mediterranean outpost, only to discover that it's also a Meditine fight club guarded by Queen Bee's team of superpowered enforcers. Because nothing can be easy. Yeah. So back in that time, Young Justice became a horror movie. <laughs> The father box knocks out Wolf, Jace, and the power to the house before going after Halo with music that makes my heart like clench up. And unluckily for her, the mother box seems incapable of handling the, the wash of teen hormones and has left her without powers. We then cut back over to Greater Bialia, where the fight club is underway and the outsiders have infiltrated the event. After stealthily taking out Simon, they're able to purchase Tara during the metahuman auction and get her out safely without conflict cuz that'll that'll keep up right cuz nightwing's rich <laughs> why fight when you can just stand over yep. money and back in the happy harbor horror picture show <laughs> uh the father box corners halo but before he can kill her victor wrestles back control to give halo a chance to escape but instead of running, Halo confronts the father box and insists that while her new emotions may make her vulnerable, they can also make her strong. And if nothing else, she knows how to help people in need. Because Halo is wonderful. Uh, she, begin, she begins cleansing Victor just as we cut back to Brion removing Tara's mind control chip from her neck aboard the bioship. But saving Tara was just part one of the mission, and now Nightwing and his team have to go back to save the rest of the imprisoned Metateens. Because nothing is ever that easy. Nope. And there's no way Jeff was going to leave. Yeah, I can't no. imagine that was uh, a thing. Yeah, no. I was like, you're done? Hmm. Oh, no, we're not done. Okay, good. The group sneaks back into the facility and a trademark young, what does covert mean again? Justice fight and shoes complete with mid-battle banter about who's dating whom. Uh, Brian and Tara eventually join the fight and everyone gets out safe. Everybody gets to Happy Harbor and we find out that all the other missions around the world were also success and the rescued Metateens are now at the Metahuman Youth Center in Taos and that Victor is now permanently cleansed of Father Box's influence. Tara forgives Dr. Jace for activating her metagene and Brion introduces Halo as his girlfriend, a statement that makes her so happy that she flies into the air, telling us her powers have returned just fine after cleansing Victor. Nightwing even tells Artemis that he thinks Halo, Forager, Geoforce, and Tara might be ready to join the team. And everything's great and fine and wonderful and nothing bad happens. The end. Uh, except this is Young Justice and we've got another half a season to set up. So instead of ending there... The last scene of the episode takes place in Star City, where we see Tara Markov wake up, get up off the couch, and pull out her phone. That is what we see. We then cut over to Santa Prisca, where Deathstroke receives a text from an unidentified number that simply reads, I'm in. And dun, we don't dun, dun. know what any of it means. <laughs> These are the facts as they have been presented to us, and we shall extrapolate nothing <laughs> until crashing the mode. Is Aster the right word? We'll see. Ah. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the Aster. Oh, my goodness. Horror movie. That music... Hats off to Dynamic Music Partners. This was a big thing that pointed out, that, that jumped out at me. Now that I, I'm paying a little bit more attention or periodically trying to, oh, that almost electronica deep heartbeat music that's happening. It's almost asynchronous with my own heartbeat that makes me anxious when we cut back to the house. And it's kind of sort of electronica reminiscent, uh, like techno reminiscent that makes sense for like the scene and father box and then. The, again, the nods to uh, The Shining and like, wow, I was horrified. Yep. Ooh. I rewatching it 
people I don't know if I've brought this up before. I don't like horror movies. They're not my they're not my thing. But rewatching this episode, there was literally a point where I've seen this episode multiple times. I know what happens. Vic had some line that I think he was like, it's I think it's the like come out wherever you are line, and I literally went, Nope, 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 nope. And like yep. like reeled back from my screen. I was like, I know everything's gonna be fine, but that just viscerally like yeah. set my like ah she, no. she she closes a door, runs into the bathroom, closes another door, right? And then you hear him open the first door and then there's a long pause that feels longer than it probably was. And then he gets the, come out, come out, wherever you want. Eh, it's just no, like, Rich, no. and then he punches through the door and then, uh, so many and, doors. Then, the, and the music, like, like I said, it, 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 it cut, right. I know. Right. <laughs> He's got to know, like he knew this was coming. He so let this happen. yeah, no, he knows. But, like, you get that heavy beat, right, in scenes like that. And then it skips back to the gladiatorial combat, and there's still a beat. But it smoothly transitions into this other music that's happening during the gladiatorial combat, which is still intense. But, like, oh, man, so good. I Just saw you so point good. out the, tra- the transition in our notes, and I saw that as I was taking notes and writing the outline, and so I was paying attention to it. And it's the drum beat. It's because they... They yeah. have the drum beat transition, so any other, the rest of it, your mind just lets it change because the drum beat has transitioned it's so naturally. Enough. You're just like, yeah. there you go. That's fine. This is smooth because the central beat doesn't change too much. Yeah. Oh, yeah Music, anyway. it's fascinating. Uh, but yeah, gosh, this episode. I was happy that the Happy Harbor High School Halloween dance got to be brought up again, even though they don't get to go. I would have loved to see this group of group of weirdos at the Halloween dance. Uh, yeah. We don't get to see that. We get a horror movie instead. But I like that little nod that that's still a thing. <laughs> I'm sorry. Your, your note in here is so funny. Which one? All of my notes are nonsense. <laughs> Let these kids go to the dance, you cowards. <laughs> <laughs> Give me my teen nonsense. Yes. Uh, my kingdom for a teen nonsense. But I do also find it hilarious how Dick just walks in and just goes, Halloween's canceled. <laughs> and I'm like, oh. He's like, we, you could just be like, we're not going to the dance today. But he's like, no, the entire holiday. And my brain being the way that my brain is, I'm like, Dick, is this just is this just revenge because you didn't get to do anything fun in the season one <laughs> Halloween episode? You didn't get to go trick or treating, so now we have to cancel the whole holiday. You had to stay in with the grown ups and talk about business, so now you, you no one's allowed to have fun. <laughs> this next note, you the next note you have too. I have Dick, Dick is in business mode. <laughs> Dick is absolutely in business mode because Brion tries to have a moment where he's like, I'm going to be an emotional teenager and tell my girlfriend I love her before I go do this crazy thing. And Dick just like, is like, no speeches, Prince, and keeps walking. Right. And I'm like, Dick Grayson I, is not here for this teen <laughs> nonsense this week. I think Dick's like, Dick's like, yeah, you want to see what no patience is like? Get out of here. Let's go now. Now, 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 now. You want to do this the whole season. Whole season. Basically, basically, yeah. yeah. Oh. I had to, I had to punch you in the chest. Let's go. I had to yeah. palm strike you for you to, for you to understand. And now I'm giving you the thing. You don't get to delay on the thing. Right. I love too how like in the once they get into the bioship too, bioship fully makes her own decision about who gets to pilot her. <laughs> Superboy's like, I oh okay then, all right then. <laughs> I guess this is a thing. Yeah, which continues on my line of reasoning of like what is what's up with forager and bioship every time that forager has a line about like how awesome bioship is i'm like i don't know if it's just the alien voice jason spizak has (laughs) or if my brain is just hardwired to interpret jason spizak as like an absolute flirt no matter what character he's playing but i'm like so what's up with with bioship and forager because this is a little weird (laughs) they're very good friends they're buddies it's fine it's it's fine this is fine i mean they're they're members of the team and they're both still very unique styles of outsider to the team it's great it's fine yeah (laughs) moving on (laughs) so halo has a literal panic attack over brion like she's hyperventilating this isn't just general teen worried like that's a lot 
because Halo can't regulate her own emotions yet. And it's so stressful to watch. And Jace is a little bit too calm about it. And we'll talk about that later. But yeah, yeah, that scene sure is a lot to watch. I'm like, Halo, Halo, honey, it'll be okay. He's not going to die. And in that same scene, we also, I really love when Victor turns into the father box again and goes to attack both of them. Wolf is the one that realizes something is wrong first, and we get the payoff for the fact that Wolf has been like a tired puppy all season and finally is like, no, I'm back in attack mode and just yeah. jumps. I'm like, yay, Wolf, you're back. Oh, it's good. I, just, I do really love that. I love Wolf getting to participate because he's always the first one to know when something weird is up. Does it in season two also, and I love it. Okay, it's, I just every time I think about the whole, any part of that arc, it's just like, oh, because there's so many things going on overtly and subtly that are horrifying. We'll, we'll get to it. Crash the mode. I know. There's okay. many layers of horror. <laughs> <laughs> so then we have the whole trading depot storyline going on outside of Halo's thing. And I want to point out the one quick thing that I don't like about this. And it's one of the few times that I got annoyed with character design this season. And it's I was rolling my eyes so hard at the dress that they have Artemis in for this whole thing. Oh, my. I have no words. Right? Uh, so... <laughs> So I've just sent Rich a picture of what uh, Artemis dress looks like in this season because there's a lot happening. I'm sure it slipped a lot of people's mind. I noticed this immediately because I care about costume design and stuff. And that's a heckin' lot of a dress on Artemis in this episode. It also, we see in wide shots, has a giant slit up the thigh as well as a ridiculously plunging neckline that's not just a that's not just a deep v neckline that's like it's it's ridiculous and part of me rolls my eyes because i'm like this just looks so over the top and part of me rolls my eyes because that is not a strategic dress if you are not a tactical dress (laughs) it's not a tactically (laughs) practical dress because of just how much nonsense you would have to go through to get into a dress like that. As someone who has to wear a lot of costumes for theater, a dress like that takes a lot of a lot of nonsense and a lot yeah. of extra extra stuff to get into and stay into. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just like, no, give Artemis a dress that makes sense. I I, I am going to entirely support your <laughs> your hypotheses here. And I'm I'm going to bring up a couple things that are not really excuses for the dress, but the people there are extra. They're already wearing Court of Owls masks, <laughs> and uh, dre- and rich people who are there for show, and so on and so forth. So she does sort of fit in. Also, they were trying to make it covert. We're just going to go in and like literally hand over a bunch of money, and let's not that kind of thing. Having said that, there's still no reason for that dress. <laughs> Like that dress could be different. Yeah, especially because like also because I've I've rewatched this episode multiple times writing this outline after I like noticed it again and was like, all right, it's that dress. I was like, let me look at all of the background extras and see if oh. everyone is like this. They're not all like this. OK. All right, then. There are people because you can you can make a very fancy, very avant garde evening gown that has a neckline that does not plunge to your waist. Uh, I know nothing about fashion, and I do not believe you at all. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> but yeah, it's a minor thing. She's only in this dress for like 30 seconds, but the fact that every time I watch this episode, it stands out as like, oh my God, this dress. Um, many times over, even just this season, you have uh, you have given a shout out to Phil Bross and the design team for for clothes and and design elements uh, for like Zatanna's outfits and like many, many times. So like, I like Zatanna's streetwear. It's true. (laughs) It's it's true. Right. So like, yeah, I mean, still hats off for all the design elements. This was, this was the most like soup, like superhero comic-y looking thing. (laughs) Yeah. Anyway, enough about the dress. Let's move on to devastation and Simon. 
No. You were going to give us a mini super sweethearts about no. this, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I'll read you exactly what my notes say. I will, re- for a dramatic reading for those of you at home, for this part that Rich is referencing, my notes simply say so devastation and Simon are a thing. <laughs> oh, I read it and as a thing. The end. <laughs> Yes. There are things. This this seed was planted eight years ago. No, this seed was planted two years ago. Well, Are we talking in show time? Oh, in show time. I'm saying like in show time. They've been a thing for years. They've been a thing since season Season, two. No, season season one, right? No. Oh, season two. You're right. Okay, fine. In the episode where we have our all still more, It's still more time than Brion and Halo have had. Rich, no. Rich, don't go down this path. No. I'm just, that sounded so antagonistic. I'm like, no. I'm just goading Emily now. I don't it, need to be goaded. I don't I I don't need this. It's like Lagan all over again. Oh my goodness. Uh let's move on to something completely different then. Like what, Rich? How about Mr. Bliss? <laughs> all right, guys, Mr. Bliss. What about him, Rich? Well, once, ag- once again, Mr. Bliss is another Starman villain. So we've already had Mist. There's so much going on. So these, I mean, I can't imagine this is crashing the mode. These masks are Court of Owls masks. Might be crashing the mode. I don't, I don't well, we don't know, really. I mean, like, these masks are a thing. These masks are a thing in DC Comics for this organization called the Court of Owls. But the Court of Owls is something very different than this. The Court of Owls in the comics had to do with this uh, organization that kind of secretly ran Gotham and a lot of other things in in the world. But they had this enforcer, this assassin enforcer that would work for them called Talon. And that enforcer was found and trained and so on and so forth through some variation of Haley's Circus where Dick grew up. And so in the comics, like Dick Grayson had been being groomed to become the next Talon. And the Talon that shows up in the comics is like Dick's grandfather or something that's been kept alive. He's kind of undead or something. I, I didn't quite grasp a lot of that. But Mr. Bliss as a character is an incubus. So he's a demon that that feeds off of emotions. And he would he had his own circus. And he would feed off the emotions in the crowd at, at being the ringleader of that circus. And so I it's I don't know what this connection is, but the fact the Court of Owls with Haley's Circus and Bliss with a circus background, even though this isn't a circus, it's something else. There's something going on with this. I think part of me is like w- was a little bit like, oh, he's trying to be jokerish. And I it, I felt like maybe that should bug me, but it doesn't. I think it's beautiful. I think it's great. I think Troy did a fantastic job as Mr. Bliss in getting that that ringleader almost quality in his voice. So, yeah. We'll see. Like that I have nothing to add to that. There's the the cage that's around the kids. Yeah. Uh they're the same kind of design as the field projectors that we saw in season 1, the end of season 1 as yep. well. So that's a nice consistency of design as well. Gosh, what else? The conversation between Connor and Icicle Jr. We got to talk about that. <laughs> Cuz that's just that's just gold. That is just gold. I love it so much. It made me so happy. It's so strange. It, it it should stick out as so strange. And it is every piece of it is so perfect for character, for who these two are, the echoes to their history. The fi- It's, I laugh so hard <laughs> every time I see this conversation. It's so good. It's just this way too calm conversation about who stole whose girlfriend eight years ago. Connor literally mangles a tank while talking about how he started dating his fiance. And I'm like, this is peak young adult superheroes. And I love it. I love that he's still way too chill with Icicle Jr. He's just like, nah. We're buddies. We're what? buddies who Connor's try to like, kill each you other. N- it's fine. You are no threat to me. Junior, you are no threat to me. And then when he's like, we're engaged now. And Junior just flips and he's just like, oh, I'm so pr- I'm so happy for you guys. Maybe that means I'm okay. I'll find someone. And Connor's like, I hope so. And then kicks him in the face. 
Like it's just it feels like this is like a conversation they've had. Like every time they run into each other, Ice Club Junior's just like, You stole my girl and Superboy's like, I didn't and they just go back <laughs> like, and forth. Not in any way. There was nothing about any of that. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> like not even a little bit. I liked her and you kissed her anyway. Yeah, but I liked her first and also right. she wasn't And also who she you wasn't she who was. you thought yes, exactly. <laughs> so it's great. I love that uh, little throwback. I love a lot. We also get to see the Terror Twins again this episode. Oh yeah, they grew uh, up. Yeah, they have a complete. They got complete redesigns that I actually really love. I love mm-hmm. that they because I remember back during season two when we saw the Terror Twins. I remember I threw out the idea where I was like, "Why did Tommy Terror get a redesign and Tuppence Terror didn't?" And then this season, they're like both get redesigns. I'm like, good. Yep. I'm here for it. Yeah. Uh, they both have new costumes. They both decided that shaving their heads was the best option. Uh, they yeah. both have a bunch of new scars, which is cool. Overall, it's just real cool. Like, they look different. Those two look like they've been through a lot over the past seven, eight years. Yes. <laughs> Gosh, there's a there's a bunch of stuff I keep wanting to talk about, and it all has to be crashing the mode. Okay, this will be a very crashing the mode heavy episode. Okay, so I have a question for you, Emily, because I'm not sure. I'm not sure about this. So, hey, a Holocaust gets purchased, and and Terra both get purchased, right? Yes. There's a moment where they take the time to show Holocaust getting into the limousine, and he's looking back at at Terra. But who's opening the door? Because it looks. And I didn't check the designs, but for a second there, this last time I watched it, it looks like Harjofti. It looks like President Harjofti's brother. What? What, Rich? What? Is it Suman or was that? I think the president's name was Suman and his brother. His brother was the one that was in the comic, tie-in comics. And, but the thing that, because they're in Kurak, right? Or not, they're in um, Greater Bialya. But then I was like, is, didn't they say something about this is Queen Bee's enforcers and these are Queen Bee's people. So would she need to purchase any of these or would she get the pick of the litter, so to speak? But the guy looked like the former President Harjafti's brother to me. And I didn't check the designs, like I said, back and forth. And I was just wondering if you picked up on that or saw that yourself. He didn't have any lines, so he doesn't get anything in the end. And maybe the design just looks similar to me, or maybe I'm just remembering completely wrong. I didn't. I have no idea. I was focused on a lot this episode trying to write notes, so I got no insight into that. Also, why is why did they take the time to show Holocaust looking back at Terra? Crashing the mode. We'll get to it. I have some ideas, too. I'm throwing it out there. Yeah. Ah! Um, but, so... Halo gets her cool moment where she gets to be like, I'm strong and I help people. And that made me happy. And Mm -hmm. that confrontation is so good. I love that she doesn't run away. I love that Victor goes out of his way not to wrest control back for himself, but he's just trying to protect Halo and give her a chance to run. I love that she doesn't run. And I love that her turning point is basically a very teenager turning point kind of thing where it's i don't know what i'm doing but i know how to do this one thing right now i don't know what my life is doing right now i don't Mm -hmm. know how i'm feeling i don't know how this is affecting me but i can do one thing and i can do one thing really well and that's what i'm gonna do yeah because halo might be a mother box and might be a bunch of other stuff but she's also a teenage girl yeah (laughs) and it works really well as that moment and letting her be a superhero whose weakness quote unquote, is also her strength and showing that way that emotions make her stronger. And I love it. There's so much wrapped up in Halo as such an empathetic character and a very emotional character. And I love her. Adding on to that, like the reason she's like she runs and that's that's understandable. Like she's 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 like, but Victor and he's like, run the way Zeno delivers that run. It's like, (sighs) I am not messing around right now. Like this is not a cliche TV conversation. You need to move. Um, And she gets up and runs, which is understandable. But the reason she stops running is because Victor stops screaming. So he's screaming, fighting father box, and then it goes dead quiet. And then she stops. 
because like while he's while Vic is screaming, she knows he's fighting. And then he stops. She knows he's not fighting anymore. And that is what kind of seems to me is what flips the switch of like, my friend is not okay. Like yeah. someone, someone I know is not okay. It doesn't even have to be her friend, like for not for her. It could be anyone. But like, oh, man, that whole scene is good. So good. And we talk about that, the whole scene with Zara as well, about her emotions and feelings behind that scene and what that means and represents. And, and the fact that all of the characters get agency, you know, like Vic, Vic is allowed to have agency in this yeah. to some extent. And now I think this, this thing that he goes through, yeah, he's mad and angry, but I think he, I think when he, at the end of this episode where he's just like, um, Father Box's influence is no longer affecting me anymore, I feel like he as a person is completely changed. And yeah. before he was having so much like me, 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 me. And I think he's starting to see like there's something bigger going on here. And I really like that moment for him as well. It's so good. They got such good stuff going on. I really like it. Oh, this is a good point you make in here too about the masks. I actually didn't think about that. Yeah, I threw out, there's a random, there's a moment, because these masks we have seen a couple of times and we know that they fooled recording technology and they seemingly fooled Count Vertigo in the first couple right. of epi- in the first couple of episodes because he has to take Connor's mask off before before he realizes that it's Superboy. He keeps being like, who is this? What could this possibly be? And then takes the mask off and he's like, ah, Superboy. Whereas Icicle Jr. is just like, this doesn't matter. I know exactly who you are. And I'm like, are but doesn't we trying he, doesn't to- Doesn't he say something like, you can't, you can't fool me? That mask doesn't fool me. I'd recognize yeah. you anywhere or something like that. And I'm yeah. like, I don't know if you're just trying to imply that like- It's a Icicle mask. Icicle Jr. and Superboy are- closer than <laughs> Superboy and Count Vertigo. Like, Count Vertigo just doesn't know what Superboy looks like on the regular, compared to, like, Ice School Jr., who presumably has some level of yeah. familiarity right. with Connor. Who has, who has been in... Ice School Jr., who has been in the show since literally the first episode... First minutes of the first episode. <laughs> yeah. Everybody gets one villain friend. You get to pick one villain friend. <laughs> and Connor <laughs> chose Ice School Jr., and that's where we stand. Uh, totally. Uh, but yeah, uh, I don't know what's up with the masks. Are they just masks? Are they more advanced than that? It's like we had, like we had said, like the spiral technology that we're wondering if this is part of it. Like had the spiraling out face thing, like in the in the comics that actually confused normal people, like people too, not just technology. Yeah. But we just don't know in this case, so we'll have to see. Anyway, or it could just be a mask. I mean, it just could be a mask, and and like. People wear masks and you don't know who they are. And that may have been what happened with Vertigo and that's fine. But yeah, there seem to be some impl- implications. The West Maneuver. Aww. The more I think about it, the more I love it. Because he didn't say, Connor didn't say to Bioship. He didn't say Bioship West Maneuver. He said Forager West Maneuver, which means they've taught that maneuver to the kids, to the new team as part of all of the other maneuvers that they have to knock somebody's legs out from under, from behind them. Yeah. <sighs> so good. Real good. So good. Nice little continuity things. <laughs> Speaking of continuity, kind of, and that I talked about this last week too, but I'm just, I'm going to point this out real quick and we can move on to other things. But again, the jump to Brion calling Violet his girlfriend feels a little unearned to me. And I tried to do some stuff. I tried to do some math uh, to see if this was me being crazy or not. And like chronologically, I did way, I did way too much searching on this. Chronologically, there is more time in universe, in universe that passes between the first Brion and Violet kiss and the first time we hear him call her his girlfriend compared to like Superboy and Miss Martian who have about a week between when they kiss in terrors and when she calls him her boyfriend over the mental link uh, in the alpha male episode. But it feels like more time and feels more earned to me in that case mm-hmm. than here. 
especially because that also it may also be context of like other times when we've heard people say that it gets brought up. Miss Martian only brings it up when she's annoyed. They don't put a label on it until she's an annoyedly being like, you're my boyfriend, not my keeper. Yeah. Whereas here, Halo D- Brion is just like, and this is Halo, my girlfriend. And I'm just like, you, we haven't seen enough of you two for me to be very excited about you <laughs> calling her your girlfriend. Yeah, And it's again, just that thing of like, I feel like we haven't seen enough of them for me to feel like that's a big earned moment. I hear you. Because it's presented as a big earned moment, but it doesn't feel that way. Yeah. Whereas in previous seasons, when there has been something like this, where there hasn't been a lot of time, it has been a throwaway line. Miss Martian calling Connor her boyfriend is a throwaway line that she says and walks off and there is no pomp and circumstance about it. Whereas this is like yeah, presentation of the royal girlfriend. <laughs> and I'm sitting here being like... Literally the royal girlfriend. <laughs> yeah. Right. And I'm just like, eh. <laughs> They're cute. Give me more of them so that I can root for them and care. I have to, I have to say on on a different note, there was the there's a moment between Jace and Tara that I appreciated on a similar level to to the end of season one, where you expect Connor to take off and go to Santa Prisca, and there's going to be all this drama, and he's not going to tell his friends about the blackmail or his dad, and like all this stuff. Like you just think it's all going to be super cliche. And then it turns out to be not that at all. And they actually are relatively mature and, and it address their issues. And where Jace apologizes. Yeah. And says, I'm so sorry. And Tara saying like, wait a minute. <laughs> There's two sides to this story. I heard them. I know they were going to kill me if you didn't do what you were doing. I know that you were still trying to help me in this terrible situation and did the best you could. Like that's a that's some powerful powerful maturity going on on that level. Yeah. yeah, it raises some other questions, maybe some crashing the mode questions. But I like the way that they represented it. and Brian pointing it out, like you know, like you, you you there's more to you than everything. And this is this is a reason why I think I'm I understand Dick saying like maybe Tara as well might be ready for the team because of what he's seeing in her maturity level. I'm still a little up off put by him adding her to that list so quickly. Yep. Cause he, cause he was so up on the others being trained together. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe because he saw her working together with Brian as well. Like during that fight scene. And like, he knows she has fight training compared to the rest of them. It's like she right. got it in a really horrible way, but she knows how to use her powers in a way the rest of them don't. But it's like at trust level, yeah, crashing the mode. <laughs> yeah, we we'll have to crash the mode. I don't know. I think we should probably even lean into crash the mode right now. Uh, do you have anything else? No, nah, I think I've covered all of my nonsense. Unless we have anything from nope. Neil that we want to shout out. Uh, all the sixteens, right? Tara is listed as the number sixteen on the dark web. Artemis uses paddle number 16, timestamp 316. Neil does have some things, but I think they also get couched in some crashing mode. So let's uh let's uh let's head into the mid-roll here. Uh we'll do our debrief and some fan service and then crash the mode. Ah, yeah. Uh welcome to the fake your own death club. Its membership is very exclusive, and I'm the president. Hello, team, and welcome to the mid-roll. This week we have a new five-star review. This one from Garrison Davis. Feelings, healthy fandom, and storytelling. The YJ Finals is one of the best storytelling analysis podcasts out there. They provide a great breakdown of Young Justice, talking about its arcs, characters, teenage romance, and storytelling choices. But the podcast is so much more than episode breakdowns. In the discussion episodes, you get to hear from people from varying perspectives and experiences in life and have left me teary-eyed on more than one occasion. The show is just so wholesome and positive and wonderful and has actually gotten me to be a better person and help me with self-discovery. Big thanks and kudos to the whole Whelm team. Thank you, Garrison. We really appreciate that. We'd also like to welcome our newest Patreon member, Katrina Kurds. Katrina, welcome to Beta Squad. For those of you attending San Diego Comic-Con, DC Universe will be holding a panel covering all their shows on Saturday, July 20th, from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. in the Indigo Ballroom of the Hilton Bayfront, next to the convention center. Producer Neil and I will be attending Friday and Saturday, so feel free to message us and say hello. 
Because the full weekend schedule hasn't been officially set for the cast and crew, we don't have any info yet on a fan gathering. But if and when something comes up, we'll post it here to the Twitter feed. It's just a few days now until new episodes for Season 3 are released. For those who haven't heard, three episodes will be released to DC Universe July 2nd, with one new episode a week for seven weeks, then the final three episodes the last Tuesday in August. So how does this new schedule affect us? Well, our plan is to release a Scream Something volume after the release of every two to three episodes. Between those Scream Something volumes, we'll be airing a number of bonus episodes, including discussions with the host of DC Daily, Hector Navarro, DC Universe writer Joshua Lappin Bertoni, podcaster and fan Dylan Weaver, and columnist for Young Justice TV Ariel Horn, and even more. Once we get through the run of Scream Somethings, we'll return to our weekly dives into each individual episode. And with all that out of the way, let's get back to the show. Stick around. Class is in session. In our Canary Debrief, we'll be discussing what we can learn about the creative process from the episodes that we review. This season of Young Justice highlights a unique quality of comics that is only just recently being realized by the general public. If we put entertainment into broad categories, movies, novels, TV, comics, etc., you can talk about them in relation to genres. This movie is a romantic comedy or a science fiction story. This novel is a horror or mystery or thriller. This TV series is Monster of the Week. And though a comedy might have drama and a sci-fi series might have monsters, the genres are generally consistent even over a trilogy. What comics have evolved to do over the past 80 years that others don't is allow creators to flip between every genre, even within the same series. Some of this became evident to movie fans with Marvel's recent success over the last decade. The first Avenger is a period piece, while Winter Soldier is a spy thriller. The Dark World has elements of suspense, while Ragnarok is a sci-fi comedy. Black Panther is as much a film about familial bonds as it is about international intrigue. Young Justice has always had an underpinning of spy thriller mixed with teenage drama, but this season has been able to highlight DC Universe's true range, from comedy and private security to galaxy and history-spanning epic and evolution to existential crisis in Nightmare Monkeys, to the echoes of horror and suspense that we get with true heroes. The beauty of comics to me has always been the range of stories that you can explore, even with the same characters in the same series, and I've never seen a series master that better than Young Justice. So what can we learn about storytelling from this episode? That the lives of these characters and the lives of real people move from genre to genre. At times, our lives are comedies. At other times, they're tragedies. Sometimes they're filled with action, and at other times, they're existential crisis. When you're creating a character, keep these things in mind. For their world, and for the story you're telling, but even more so, for creating layered, interesting, and varied people that your readers or watchers can understand. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. In fan service, we take some time to highlight the amazing fan-related creation celebrating DC, Young Justice, and other creative works that we think Young Justice fans will love. Um, this week, we wanted to highlight the work of some other big fan <laughs> services, <laughs> including the work being done over at youngjustice.tv. Uh, if you head over to their website, their website has character breakdowns, they have cast bios, there's uh, sections that they're uh, continually building out that have fan fiction connections and fan art uh, they have articles that they keep putting out that we see a lot on uh, that are being posted on Twitter and more. As Emily has mentioned in the past, uh, we actually have one of their writers, Ariel Horn, is coming on as well to talk to uh, to talk to Emily about romantic emotional scenes. Oh, emotional scenes! I like we that. also talk about Roy and Cheshire quite a bit because we're both shippers. Oh, that's right. I'm really I'm up for that. Can't wait. Uh, there's a lot of work being uh, put in by fans to create these hubs of information about Young Justice. The Young Justice Wiki we mention all the time. They're fantastic. The Young Justice fan vids and YJTV, they cover so much of the fandom. Um, they do it out of the kindness of their heart and because of their passion for the show. And we wanted to end our Season 3A reviews by encouraging you to support them all and becoming yourself active kind, supportive, encouraging members of the community. We'll have links to all three of them in the show notes. 
And before we move on, I do want to give a quick shout out to the fact that several of them, several of these big pillars of the of the fandom are doing an ongoing campaign called hashtag crash the mode where they have a whole schedule up of different Twitter things and different fun events that they're doing on Twitter to encourage fan engagement all throughout uh, the month of June leading up to the new half a season that we're getting. They've done a bunch of cool stuff. You can check out the schedule on their Twitter and on the youngjustice.tv website and all over the place. People sharing favorite moments and favorite stuff from the comics and why their favorite characters are their favorite characters. And it's just a whole really fun thing to encourage general fandom engagement and get everybody hyped for the new half a season we're getting soon. Awesome. All right, let's get on to some crushing the mode. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that. We're all feeling the mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in season three, which is all of them. In Crashing the Mode, we'll be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on wild flights of fancy. These spoilers will be based on these all 13 episodes. Just these 13, if you're listening in the future, because that's all we've seen at this time. We have a few weeks to wait still for the rest of it. If you're spoiler wary, (laughs) this is your warning. The very top of our notes is... uh, Emily has put in um, a picture of a conspiracy board. What is this from? I've seen this so much. (laughs) This is from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Right. Completely (laughs) child inappropriate show. Do not show it to your to your young ones. Uh, But this is a good meme. It's a whole thing. People who have seen the show or seen the clip know how ridiculous this moment is. But it's us with this hairbrush and with Jace in general. It's all about this hairbrush and Jace. I have so many things. This whole thing, I'm like, Tara and Jace are having this very mature adult conversation. And part of me, and part of me is like, wow, that's really adult of them. If I didn't already suspect they were working together. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. So about this hairbrush. So I I don't, the hairbrush. I don't even know if I have anything to add about this hairbrush. This hairbrush. So, as we said, in, as you said in our Scream Somethings, as you pointed out, and I believe I fell on the ground trying to process <laughs> this, the hairbrush and the fact that they bother to show Jace picking up the hairbrush at the end in a, a destroyed apartment where it shouldn't matter tells us that Jace has Halo's DNA. Yeah. And that's ominous. And rewatching that scene after a full rewatch season of us just not trusting Jason the slightest, it just feels creepy and manipulative and not great. Like rewatching it, every time I rewatch it, Halo looks more and more uncomfortable. Yeah. And like you might think like, well, so what? They had they must have had Gabrielle Dow's DNA, right? So so what's the big deal? Except Number one, that lab was blown up. Number two, she died. So would they keep it on file? Maybe, I guess. But they don't have it now that it's been literally, I don't know, manipulated, changed, altered in some way because of exposure to the, to the mother box. That's a possibility. Um, and as a scientist, she might be like, hmm, wonder if there's anything in here I could use. Or she's just thinking about her daughter and being sad. And picking up a hairbrush and thinking back on the moments. She could be a very kind person. She's not. She's full on evil. But I can't. We also get no further elaboration about Jace's backstory. And that just sets me on edge. But also, also, okay. So I'm just, I'm thinking way too much about this hairbrush thing. Okay, 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 okay. (laughs) That's us right now. Okay, okay, okay. I've got my cork board. Let me pull some strings. (laughs) I'm literally the question. We, right that was exactly. I was um, like, we're all, we're both the question from Justice League Unlimited. So the thing with the hairbrush, the thing with this hairbrush, we can't let it go. The scene where she brushes Halo's hair. When she suggests this, Halo looks uncomfortable and looks at Vic because she is uncomfortable with Vic being in the room if she is taking off her hijab yes. is how I read that scene. Yes. And instead of going, oh, you're uncomfortable I'll back off. She tells Vic to leave the room, which 
means Halo is alone, basically, which to me makes that creepier Mm -hmm. and more manipulative and weirder and just sets me more on edge. Because he doesn't, but he doesn't. The the other thing that's strange is he doesn't actually leave the room. He just says, "Pretend, pretend I'm not here," and then kind of walks away and doesn't pay attention. Right? Yeah. Or or, sort of doesn't, but he can still hear the conversation. I don't know. And here's another thing. I well, no, that wouldn't be. I don't know. The when Vic turns, it's because she says like, "Oh, I don't think the mother box can handle her emotions or whatever." Like she she literally says that to Vic, and then the father box is like, "Oh, really? Well, let yeah, me she just literally, she let literally me just take says, over my meat Halo puppet a, here, <laughs> right?" She literally says Halo is in a very vulnerable state. Right That's now. what it was. Yeah. That's it's the wording. It's like. Why, why are you calling her vulnerable? That's... Mm, 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 mm. It's all... Mm. She is so uncomfortable to me. So uncomfortable to me. I don't like it. I don't like it either. The other thing that I mentioned briefly when we were talking about this in the outline is Jace is also just super calm about this. Like, to me, to me, it reads as way too calm. Like, yes, I know you are supposed to remain calm, when someone is having a panic attack, that is a good practice to have. But Jace seems almost like inordinately calm and just keeps brushing this aside as like, oh, you're fine. It's, this is fine. This is totally normal for a teenage girl. And I'm like, this is a little, a little step beyond just like a normal level of emotional teenage girlness. Like this is a lot. This is Halo hyperventilating, which yeah. is because Mother Box can't handle any of this and does not know how to process feelings right now at the moment. Right. But to me, it's just like because I don't trust Jace. Everything Jace does feels weird. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of, I don't know. So we talked about. If Jace is who we suspect her to be, this Tara thing and and that, that Jace is working with them and this Tara thing is that they're, they, she knows <laughs> that Tara is working for them. Then let's go back to the Tara Macomb hypothesis. <laughs> and yeah. if for some reason you haven't heard a previous Crashing the Mode, um, there is a theory out there uh, by someone we still haven't figured out who it was. I, I I, I think that it was either on Reddit. I said it was on Reddit before, but it might be have been on Tumblr. I don't know. Someone had sent to us about the idea that this Tara might not be Tara at all. It might actually be Macomb. And so while I'm watching this, I am this time around, I'm watching her powers and how they work. And I'm like, no, these all look like they could be telekinetically related. I, I could see this and I'm fine with that. Except there's one thing that jumps out at me is that they go a really long way to make sure we know why McGann is not on this mission with them. Like Connor goes in a whole spiel about like, Oh, this is why we traded super cycle for, you know, blah, blah, blah. And this is why, you know, McGann's not here because she's with this other mission. And let me just tell you why this is. And I'm just like, like it didn't hit me the first time, but with this theory in play, I'm just like, because even if she's not using tele telepathic abilities, if she's using telekinetic abilities, they're still psychic. And McGann may not, may understand, may read it. And it can't happen forever. Right? Like if Tara is going to use her powers in front of McGann, we might get a, a confirmation or something of this or, or a dismissal of this hypothesis soon. Yeah. But this particular I, episode. And how we brought up when we were first talking about this, about how it would, on some level, if if we go the full tinfoil hat and and Tara is Macomb and all of that, and they are using telepathic abilities to kind of influence the team and make them trust this Tara that's mm-hmm. not Tara. Mm-hmm. It would explain why Nightwing just yep. accepts and is like, put her on the team. Yeah. He, and it's possible that he might, that, that Macom might be able to put almost like post hypnotic suggestions, like implant these ideas in people and then turn it off. Like, no, I'm yeah. going to go in and I'm going to, I'm going to flip this. I'm going to flip this switch in you, or I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do a neural, neural pathway bypass 
into uh, an area of, like you're going to treat me with the same level of trust as you treat to the rest of the team real quick and then be done. And once that's set up, he doesn't have to keep influencing Dick. And it's it's subtle and small enough that it's like I didn't notice it the first time, you know, but it's subtle and small enough that that might be a thing where he doesn't have to maintain it. And if he doesn't have to maintain it, then that may be something else. I don't know. Could be. And along those same lines of, I threw this in there, of this million three watch, I had a moment where my brain was like, Tara doesn't look like the Tara we've been presented with before. Passed through my head as a thought. Yeah. And maybe it's just the shorter hair or the different lighting or the explicit lack of makeup on Tara now. But Tara looks to me weirdly a lot younger than she did in the photo that we see of her that was taken two years ago before she was kidnapped and again i might be both tinfoil hat yeah right now she's supposed to be 13 in that picture and she doesn't look 13 in that no picture. and it could be that she's got that thing where they you know she's dressed she has a dress and she's got like a shawl on and a tiara and makeup and yeah, I mean, I can see the difference. It's possible. I just might, I might be absolutely off base with this. I just, yeah. it hit my brain too much for oh, me no, to we're let it go. Oh, no, we're full on paranoid. So, you know. Which <laughs> would, to me, explain, like, what's up with, like, if it is Macomb, like, Macomb might not get it perfectly right because, like, mm-hmm. he doesn't know Tara. He doesn't know what Tara looks like that well. Maybe. Even if or he maybe showed him he, photos. Maybe he does, or maybe he doesn't. I don't know. We Depends don't know. On what happened to the real Tara. I it don't know. does. The closest thing I have to any real evidence about this is that when we... that This is so dumb. The photo that we see of her in the first episode of the season, Tara has a has a dimple on one side of her face when she smiles that she doesn't have in this episode at all. <laughs> Wow. Hi. I thought that, too hard about this. That may be, that ranks up with one of the most tinfoil, tinfoil hat theories we have had yet. Yeah, but I know. You I'm are, not sure I believe it. You are but. correct. Um, looking at the photos. Oh my gosh. Seriously. Are we, is, are we these fans now? We were pretty bad before. This is ter- so like, I'm not saying terrible. I agree with this. I'm saying I'm throwing this out there. As oh no, concept. just it just saying like, hey, you noticed it. It's just something to notice. (laughs) Wow. I'm just going to cry into my pop filter. (laughs) That's a quote, too. Whelmed, where we cry into our pop filters. Did you have anything before I I bring up my thing? I have one one other theory, crashing the mode thing, to throw out. Because we touched on it a little bit. But you mentioned that uh, they explicitly show... That they explicitly show us that one Holocaust was purchased at this auction. Yes. Uh, I hate saying that. I hate saying it so I, much. Yes. Two, they show him look back at Tara before they both get into their separate limousines and drive away. Three, they don't save him. The team does not save this child at nope. all. And so I think because emphasis was put on this, we're going to see him again. Yeah. And that won't be good. Well, yes, because Holocaust Holocaust is a known quantity character from Milestone slash DC. I agree with you. I wonder if Holocaust knows that Tara, either one, that Tara is not Tara and Tara is something, something else, or two, that Tara has been brainwashed and is working, and this is Tara, and is working with, and, and like just making that eye contact of like, okay, things are going according to plan, right? That That's also a, passed through my head. Yeah, but, <laughs> all right. So back in Nightmare Monkeys, <laughs> remember last episode when I said, remember this thing? Monkey says, maybe it was my magic that stopped you from being brainwashed forever. Okay, that's a pretty strong implication. Brainwashed forever. Not brainwashed to go to this place and then get a control chip put in you. Brainwashed forever. Dick says, again, how the goggles actually brainwash the subjects. That's actually brought 
up again. So if that's the case, what if not only Tara was a plant, but all of the teenagers that they rescued were a plant as well? Because all of those teenagers were brought to the relay depot via Goo Goggles, and now they're all at the MetaHuman Teen facility. <laughs> Emily has gone quiet. <laughs> what exactly are you implying, Rich? I'm implying that if they already, if they set this up, if they, if, if the lights set this whole thing up, which is what our implication is, right? That who stands outside their base and talks openly about their plans, that they planted the granny thing, that they, that they led the team to get Tara in the first place, to basically set up all of this stuff, knowing that they would figure out where Tara was and to go get her. If this was actually a thing, then why wouldn't the other teens they rescued be a thing? Why would they only have Tara? Why would they not put the rest of the teens in on this and have a whole, like a bunch of, like we've seen trailers for the next season and Ed's there and Ed and his dad work for the teen center, right? So the teen center is getting involved in some way, form, or fashion. Somehow, the teen center is getting involved, and I'm thinking the rest of these kids they saved are going to try to get the other kids back. <laughs> That's what I think. I think the control ship. I think the. Con I think once the good goggles showed up, the control chips are not actually a thing anymore. I don't think they need the control chips anymore. <sighs> yep. Next half a season is going to kill us. <laughs> and we'll find none of our none of our red yarn theories are true. And, and it's worse than we could have possibly expected. You know what I want, Rich? What do you want? I just want a superhero wedding. <laughs> yes. Why did I not answer that? I knew what that was. I want one thing. <laughs> <laughs> no, people have already drawn art of both of them in wedding attire and like... <sighs> It's I fine. want I want Dark Side to show up and say, I'm evil, but I can't break up a wedding and then turn around and leave. That's what I think. And on that happy note. <laughs> All right, guys, we are going to see you in like a week or two from when this we're gonna see these new episodes in a week or two from when this airs. I can't remember uh, when it's gonna air. Oh my gosh. Three episodes a week up until the last uh, week of uh, July, and then uh four episodes all dumped at once. And we'll get the full story. Uh, also, we'll uh, maybe be, well, I'll be at San Diego Comic-Con. We'll see if there are any announcements there uh, about anything else. So we'll have to see um, what's going on there if it hasn't been made already by the time this episode airs. And with all of that, let's say it out of the Watchtower. Thank you for spending some time with us in this first half season uh, talking about this incredible show. If you'd like to join us in the discussions, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode on Tumblr at thyjfiles.tumblr.com and at our website, crashingthemode.com. And if that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S. since we have to look a little harder to find those ones. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.